Like so many people, in today's day and age, they have this jahiliya practice. If they are given tidings of a girl, they become sad. Yet they do not know that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said regarding the births, the two births, first two births of first two children, if they are girls, then that is blessing. And it is an authentic hadith that any house which has two girls, a special type of rahmah, special type of mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala descends in that house. So, in the days of Jahiliya, they would bury these girls. And likewise, when inheritance, when a, a person would die, their daughter would not receive any share of inheritance. Similarly, the women would be barred from inheritance. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed Surah Al-Nisa, giving the women their rights, giving women the inheritance. There is no chapter of jurisprudence throughout al quran al kareem that has been detailed only in al quran al kareem For instance, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَأَقِيمُ الصَّلَاةِ Establish your breath, yet you do not find the tafsil, the details of aqimu salah in al quran al kareem But which chapter of Al-Fiqh Jurisprudence, do you find detail within the Quran? It is Al Miraf, inheritance laws. Throughout Al Quran, Al Quran, especially in Surah Al Nisa, you find the details to Al Miraf. The second chapter, which is named after a specific woman, is Surah Al Sayyidatina Maryam alayhi salam. The only chapter. And you will also find another particular point when you ponder the names of Al-Qur'an Al-Kareem أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ أَمْ عَلَىٰ قُلُوبٍ أَقْفَالُهَا Do they not ponder over the Qur'an أَمْ عَلَىٰ قُلُوبٍ Or do they have on the hearts the locks to the hearts, the fetters to أَقْفَال Plural of Qufi Meaning ponder over the Qur'an You will notice no woman is mentioned in Al-Qur'an Al-Kareem by name except Sayyidatina Maryam They are referred to, but not by the name. Even Zulaikha, the wife, the, the, the woman who was the wife of whom the wazir in Egypt, she is not named. Likewise, the other women are not named. But Sayyidatina Maryam is named. What is the wisdom of this? There are many reasons. One of the few reasons is because people ascribe an enormity to Sayyidatuna Maryam What was that enormity that she gave birth, na'udhu billah, to God Almighty? Or as the Christians will say, they have a trinity and the trinity constitutes of three deities. Or they would say God of one substance is three entities, which is the Trinity. So they believe the Son, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and they believe the Son was sired, and birth was given to him by Sayyidatuna Maryam alayhi salam. But to invalidate this claim, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala named Sayyidatuna Maryam alayhi salam in order that no doubt and speculation remains that this woman was a blessed woman, but she did not give birth to God Almighty. Similarly, some people ascribe divinity to Maryam so this was also negated in Al-Quran al But note also, it also demonstrates that there is no racism towards Ben Israel in Al-Quran al as a race. As an ethnic group, there is no racism to what people refer to as Jews today. Uh, the correct name would be what Ben Israel, because Judaism is based on one tribe of Ben Israel, which is the tribe of Judah. But Ben Israel, the progeny of Israel, which is Sayyidina Ya'qub, there is no place for racism in, in an Islam that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala honored. A woman who today would be termed as a Jewish woman. 
سيدتنا مريم عليه السلام glory woman name in the Quran Karim so سيدتنا مريم عليه السلام there is a common claim made today amongst evangelists and we as younger Muslims must be aware of this the claim that Al Quran Al Karim is copied from the New Testament and the Old Testament yet if a person had sufficient time and research and they read through the Old Testament and they read through Al Quran Al Karim they would see a disparity between the two there is no copying at all for instance in the Old Testament you have ascription to Jacob and Ya'qub that he slept with his daughter-in-law from which the progeny of Jesus descends you find these stories or the ascription to Nuh that he was drunk and naked similarly to Lut that he committed they ascribed him that he committed incest with his own daughters. This is all found in the, New, uh, the Old Testament. If the Quran copied from the Old Testament, then why were these details left out? Similarly, so many of the internal contradictions found in the Old Testament are not found in Al Quran Karim. Likewise, the New Testament, the account of the birth of Sayyidina Isa alayhi salatu salam. You, if you open, there is one chapter in Al Quran Al Karim which has a story that has not been repeated throughout the rest of the Quran. How many of you can tell me which story that is? Put your hand up if you know. Is it that he's spoken in his religion? No, a story that is only told once in the Quran and not repeated. Yusuf the story of Sayyiduna Yusuf which is chapter number 12 of Al Quran Al Karim. You check the story of Sayyiduna Yusuf how the story is related in the Quran. Just read the surah. The Khufal al Quran will tell you it's the most difficult chapter to memorize. Why? Because there's no repetition of the story in other chapters. Is that not the case? Many of the Qafat, they say, this is the most difficult chapter to memorize about the Quran al Again, you check Surah Sayyidatina Maryam salam, and you check the New Testament. There are so many young people who become easily influenced by Christian evangelists that they buy this claim that the Quran was copied from the, what they have today, which is known as the Bible, even though the word Bible is from Biblos, which is a collection of books, a term which was unknown in the time of Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam himself, unless he spoke Greek, because uh, Hellenistic culture was dominant in that region at the time, so people say that he may have spoken Greek. Others say he spoke Assyria. But nevertheless, the chapter and the account of Sayyidatuna Maryam Ali Salah in Surah Maryam is totally unsimilar to what is related in the New Testament. For instance, in the New Testament, what is the first miracle ascribed to Sayyidina Isa Ali Salah? They go to a wedding after Isa Ali Salah has grown up to be a man. And when they go to the wedding, the host of the wedding runs out of wine. When he runs out of wine, Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam miraculously changes the water into wine. The first miracle ascribed to Isa alayhi salam. But what is the first miracle ascribed to Isa alayhi salam in Al Quran al Karim? Sayyidina Maryam alayhi salam goes out. To an area to give birth. She, she is instructed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the tongue of an angel. Firstly, the angel, Sayyidina Jibreel alayhi salam, appears 
with what? With the ruh, the spirit. What is the ruh? And note, in which chapter is the question? Yes, Alunata Ali Ruh in Surah Al Isra, which is chapter 17. Note the connection between each chapter. The Ruh of Isa is brought down from Alam Al Arwah, the world of the souls, at the hands of Jibreel Ali Salam. The same angel that will be mentioned in Surah Al Taha, which is chapter number 20, linked to Surah Al Sayyidatina Maryam Ali Salam. What happens in Surah Al Taha? The story of Musa Ali Salam when he crosses to the peninsula of Sinai, the Sinai Peninsula, and who observes the angel? A Samiri. He observes who? Sayyidina Jibreel Ali Salam, riding a white horse upon which wherever the white horse places its hoof, uh, the earth gives some greenery, a Samiri takes some soil and places that in the he commands when he's trying to fashion a calf from bone and then he places the soil in the calf and the calf begins to make a mooing sound. The effect is from the soil of the hoof of the horse of Jibreel Ali Salam. Why is this important? Because Jibreel Ali Salam is linked to bringing the souls of such people life. So Sayyidina Jibreel Ali Salam, he brings the soul of Sayyidina Isa Ali Salam and with one blow from far, the spirit descends into the womb of Sayyidatuna Maryam Ayyustara. This is conception. This is how she received conception. And this is why Sayyidatuna Isa Ayyustara is referred to as what? Ruhul Allah, the spirit of God. Now some people, they have deficiency in understanding Ruhul Allah. They ascribe divinity to Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam, not understanding the idafa, idafa is annexation, associating one name to another. If I say to you, the house of Allah, it does not mean that Allah lives in that house. Sayyidina Salih alayhi salam was challenged by his people. They said, if you are a true messenger, <coughs> then bring a she camel from those rocks. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought out a she camel from the rocks. From an inanimate rock, a living camel was brought out by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another khalq al adam That camel, if we say, Naqatullah, it says in the Quran, Naqatullah wa suqiyah, the camel of Allah. It does not mean Allah rides a camel, it means it's Especially created by Allah. Likewise, when we say Ruh Allah, for Isa alayhi salam, it means what? A spirit specifically created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the meaning of Ruh Allah. And likewise, when Isa alayhi salam is referred to as Kalimatun Minhu, a word from Allah. This min is min ibtidaiya. These are important points to memorize when you engage with Christians in your RS class or when the evangelists knock your door or when you engage with them, you must know what you believe in. Kalimat minhu, a word from him, the Christians they understand this to mean that the word is emanating physically from Allah. Well, ya Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is free from physicality. But what does this mean? It means min ibtida'iya. What is it? Min ibtida'iya. If I say, sirtu min al basrati al kufati, I traveled from Basra to Kufa, I started my journey from Basra to Kufa. So when we ascribe to Allah, jami'an minhum, like in Surah Al Jafiya, Everything in the creation, jami and minhu, everything is from him. Everything in creation is from Allah. What does that mean? It means its inception point, the starting point of creation was created by Allah. 
So likewise when we say Kalimatun minhu Isa is the word from Allah When Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala gave the command That Isa is salam be created Then the inception of Isa is salam started So because of this Conception Isa is salam was created without A father so when he was created without a father, there was some material aspect of Isa Ali Salam unlike any other human being. The Ruh was more dominant because everyone else is created with a father and a mother. But in the absence of a father, the Ruh is more apparent. And this is not any common Ruh. It is the Ruh of a Nabi. So the Arwah of the Anbiya, the most powerful Ruh, is the Ruh of Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The most powerful Ruh. The most powerful spirit created by Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And all the Anbiya Alayhi Wasallam, wasallam they have a powerful Ruh. Isa Alayhi Wasallam is now created fashioned and formed in the womb of Sayyidatuna Maryam alayhi salam. And remember the conception of the mothers of the Anbiya alayhi salatu salam is not like the conception of common people. They do not feel the pains uh, in the, during the development. Now Sayyidatuna Maryam alayhi salam did feel pain as mentioned in the surah in the chapter because of her young age and she was totally alone without the help of other women. But what happened in the beginning, Sayyiduna Zakariya Ali Salam, he becomes what today people would say foster father, but we would say the guardian of Maryam Ali Salam. He becomes what? The guardian of Maryam Ali Salam. When he becomes the guardian of Maryam Ali Salam, he places her in a mihrab. What is a mihrab? Uh, in today's day, like we say this is the mihrab, uh, the prayer niche at the front of the masajid. This prayer niche at the front of the masajid were created to, because in the old times they had no microphone, so uh, the imam would stand when he would recite, the voice would echo through the mihrab. There are some conspiracy theorists who make conspiracies regarding mihrab. There is no conspiracy. They, had, they didn't have these in the time of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They were incorporated later in the masajid to give echo into the masjid. But the mihrab mentioned here was actually a small and narrow room in which a person would sit for khalwa, which is what? Abstinence, staying away from the worldly pursuits in Ajdaf, while in seclusion in the masjid. So when Sayyiduna Zakariya alayhi salam placed Sayyiduna Maryam alayhi salam in seclusion, when he opened the door which could not be opened from inside and no one had the key except him, he found with Maryam alayhi salam, what did he find? Some sustenance, rizq. Some of the commentators, they say it was grapes, not in the season of grapes, which was miraculous. So when Zakariya alayhi salam finds this, he asks her, where did you get this from? She says, Anna laki hada. Where did you get this from? She then says, it's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Meaning direct. What does this mean? As I said, each chapter has miracles. Kharqul asbab, kharqul aada, violating the norms. That generally people receive rizq from asbab, from means. But Sayyidatuna Maryam alayhi was give, being given food without the normal means, asbab. This is alluding to that her child will also be born without asbab, meaning material asbab. You see the illusion. But later when she gives birth, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands her to take hold of the date tree and to shake the tree so some the dates fall down. 
so she may consume the dates. Why do the dates contain energy and proteins? Uh, dates are a fruit which contain protein, uh, which a woman needs after childbirth. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have commanded her to have the fruits without the means. Why was she commanded to shake the branch? To teach her that not everything is without means. Most things are with asbab. Most things are with means. Very rarely things happen without means. So, generally, most human beings, the overwhelming majority, are born through the asbab. Sayyidina Isa was an exception. So when he was born, what was the first miracle? As to bringing you back to the original point. That the first miracle in the New Testament was that when he was a grown man, he changed water into wine. But in Al-Qur'an Al-Kareem, the first miracle of Sayyidina Isa is when Sayyidina Maryam, alayhi salat, after giving birth, some say she gave birth in Damascus. Others say she did. the strongest statement is she gave birth in Qayt al in Bethlehem. According to the hadith in Sunan al Nasai, she comes back to her home carrying a child. The people say things. How could you have a child? How could you do such a thing? Ya Ukhta Harun. Uh, you know, in the Quran it says Ukhta Harun, and some of the Christians they try saying, Look, your Quran is wrong because it's referring to Maryam as Ukhta Harun the sister of Aaron, and Aaron was the brother of Musa a.s. This is incorrect. Who is saying that she cannot be ascribed as sister of Aaron when there can be multiple Aaron's? Or an ascription to the tribe of Harun a.s. These are some points that they pick up on. That every Muslim living in a globalized world today where you are exposed to various arguments, we must be familiar with these things. We must not be ignorant of these things. We must have the response. And you cannot claim that you were not given the response in the masajid if you are being given the response. So, at that point, she points out to the child. And they say, how can we talk to this child when he's a child who's in the, in the cradle, meaning a small child, and at that point, Isa a.s. speaks. So the first miracle ascribed in Al-Qur'an al-Kareem to Sayyidina Isa a.s. is in his childhood. Now some Christians, when they hear this, they say, uh, they say, Isa a.s. must be greater than your prophet. We say this cannot be. They say, it is so because his first miracle is to speak in the cradle. The response is very simple. The, firstly, even if it were true, the greatness is not from that one miracle. But it isn't true because our Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam not only had miracles at the time of birth, like Sayyidatina Amina, radiallahu anha, the mother of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam states as narrated in the Sahih Ahli Al-Qibad, that when the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was born, she saw a light, a nur, emanating by which the palaces of Asham, Greater Syria, and Iraq were enlightened, illuminated through the light. But there were miracles of the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, before his birth. There were miracles in the previous nations also, which is not the to a topic for today. But you can read books like Hujjatullahi Ala Al-Alameen of an Imam Yusuf al nabahani Rahmanullah, <coughs> in which he compiles over 2,000 miracles of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Which is another important point. If you count the number of miracles in the New Testament ascribed to Sayyidina Isa Alayhi Salatu Wasallam, they only number in their asharat, their tens, tens, twenty, thirty, forty. But the number of miracles ascribed to Sayyidina Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam number in their thousands. And the encyclopedia compiled by Imam Mustafa Nabahani is just one encyclopedia in which he compiles over 2,000. And then an additional difference 
is all the miracles ascribed to Sayyiduna Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that are with chains of narrations where the narrators are known, the speakers are known, their biographies are known, everything is recorded meticulously. So Sayyiduna Isa alayhi salam, he grows up in that region which we know today as Palestine. And we know that he grew up in the regions between Beit Lahm and Jerusalem, Al Quds Sharif. The city of Jerusalem has over 17 names. Over 17. Jerusalem is one. Baytul Maqdis is another. Likewise, Al Iliya is another. There's over 17 names for Jerusalem. What the Christians refer to as the ministry of Isa, they mention when his ministry started. Now, does a Muslim feel threatened by reading the New Testament? The answer is no. As long as you read the Quran. When you read the Quran and then you read the New Testament, there is no comparison. There is no insecurity on the part of a Muslim with regard to reading the New Testament. But if you have not read the Quran, if you have not studied Al Quran Al Karim, you have not studied the Ahadith of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you are not qualified to go and read the New Testament without firstly studying, studying the books revealed by Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, which have never been tampered, meaning the Quran has never been tampered. Isa Alayhi Salam starts his ministry, which in the Quran we have the narrative of how Sayyidina Isa Alayhi Salam preached to the Ben Israel. What is notably mentioned in the New Testament is that Isa goes up to what we know as Al Masjid al Aqsa. <coughs> they refer to it as the Temple Mount. We as Muslims should never use their terminology. In my book, one of my books, I use terminology like pulpit for the member. But in reality, the term member should be utilized instead of using orientalist terms. So in my new book, Islam, uh, in the new book, uh, Navigating the End of Times, I have purposely chosen Muslim terminology, avoiding orientalist terminology. So we should avoid using Temple Man. It's al Masjid al Aqsa. Yes? Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam goes to al Masjid al Aqsa Sharif. And in the New Testament, they say to the Temple Man, he finds the scribes and the Pharisees, the Jewish priests. The scribes are those who write down the Old Testament. And the Pharisees, those who give the exegesis to the commentary to the Old Testament. And he condemns the scribes and the Pharisees. And he overturns what? The changing tables. They are tables set up within the masjid, where they would carry out money transactions within the masjid. So he turns the tables and he condemns them. You read the wordings in the New Testament. You generation of vipers. Some of the Christian preachers attempt to say the Bible is full of peace. So you quote the Old Testament. They say, oh no, we didn't mean the Old Testament, we meant the New Testament. Because in the Quran there is not a single sanctioning of mindless violence. Not a single verse. When the Quran has sanctioned the killing of women, children, animals, slaves, there is no such verse in the Quran. Yet within the Bible, the Old Testament, you will find injunctions from the God of the Old Testament commanding the Israelites to go and kill the entire village, slaughter them, men, children, women, even animals. These are verses in the Bible. Where do you think the Israeli Defense Force learns its uh, rules and regulations of warfare? From the Old Testament. But there is no such verse in the Quran. This is another propaganda which young Muslims must wake up to 
that there is no violence in the mindless violence, violence in the Quran. In the New Testament, you have sayings ascribed to Isa and Salam where he says, Bring my enemies forth and slay them in front of me. There is no such statement in the Quran. Yet, through media propaganda, people, since especially post 9 11, but even before 9 11, there was a strong propaganda that the Quran is a book of violence. It is <clears throat> it works against them because then people go and check what the Quran is. Some people go on Quran.com. <laughs> they go to Quran.com and they read through the Quran. So Isa al Salam turns the tables on the Jewish scribes and Pharisees, people who, who would write down the Old Testament, and enmity enters their hearts. They do not accept the message of Sayyiduna Isa alayhi salam. But Sayyiduna Isa alayhi salam carried out numerous miracles which are mentioned in the Quran but they are not mentioned in the New Testament. Like he would make birds from clay, a model of a bird from clay, and then blow and the bird would fly. <clears throat> Why would it have such an effect? Let me explain. If the soil if the soil of the horse of Jibreel Ayyusana, wherever it would place its hoof, Samiri placed the soil in the mouth of a golden calf and the calf spoke, then what would be the effect of the roar carried by Jibreel Ayyusana and placed in the womb of Sayyidatuna Maryam Ayyusana? Be Ismillah with the divine will of Allah. Likewise, he gave life to the dead. Now the story in the Bible, in the New Testament, is the story of Lazarus. Lazarus had died. Isa alayhi salam was away. When Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam arrives, he goes to the tombs and he brings Lazarus back from the dead. The Quran mentions in general terms that he brought the living, the dead back to life. This occurred. And likewise, he would inform them of the food that they stored away in their homes. Now this da'wah of Isa al salam resulted in three groups. One group that despised Sayyidina Isa al salam who were the Yahud, led by the rabbis. And if you listen to some of those things which the Zionist rabbis say today, that teaching continues amongst those Zionist rabbis. A second group of people that misunderstood the miracles and took Sayyiduna Isa as God because his spirit was overwhelming, meaning the physical side of Isa was a sign of him without the, the conception, without a father. The Ruh of Isa was very powerful. And then the miracles, they mistaken him to be God Almighty. Later, this group was led by Paul. Now, the Christians refer to Paul as Paul the Apostle, even though he had not met Isa. He never met Isa. But he was a persecutor of the Christians. He persecuted them. And when, after Isa was taken up, he went to Damascus, Paul went to Damascus. In Damascus, he had a, an experience, the claim on the road to Damascus that he met Isa and Salam. And then he became an ardent preacher of the teachings of Isa and Salam, but what did he do? He tampered the teachings. So some of the books of the New Testament were written by Paul. And those books were guidelines for the church, the foundations of which were laid down by Paul. But the leader of the believers at the time, there was a third group which were Muslims. They mean, what does Muslim mean? Some young Muslims as well as Christians and Jews will think Muslim and Islam is something new. Islam, submission to Allah, is the religion revealed to Adam salam, and subsequently to every prophet in every generation. A Muslim 
is someone who submits to the divine will. The Muslims who followed Isa alayhi salam, they propagated Tawheed, oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the true Injil, as revealed upon Isa alayhi salam. It's speculation, but this group was led by the apostle, uh, the disciple James. This is speculation because there was a clash between the church or the teachings of Paul and James in the early foundational years. Eventually, the followers of Paul became the majority and what is known today as Christianity, the foundations of the Eastern Church, Eastern Orthodox Church, and the Western Church, which is the Roman Catholic Church. The Reformation and Protestant Christianity came about later. At this point, when Isa was preaching Islam, they plotted against him to have him crucified by the Roman authorities. When this plot is carried out, we are told in the New Testament, and remember, we can take from the Ahlul Kitab whatever conforms with the Quran and Sunnah. So sometimes the ulama, they would read through the accounts from the Christian accounts, whatever is in, in conformance with the Quran and Sunnah, we may take. But what is mentioned is that Isa al Salam dines with his disciples. They refer to them as the apostles. And in the New Testament, they mention the number 12, but in reality, the numbers were not a fixed number. This room of the Last Supper is a room which was preserved by whom? The room was preserved by Muslims. If today you go to Al Quds al Sharif to Jerusalem, you visit the grave of Dawood, which was also preserved by the Muslims. Currently, the Jewish Zionists they occupy the shrine. They occupy the shrine. But the Muslims are the ones who preserve the shrine. The building on top, if you go to the top building, which you're not permitted to go, and if you are permitted to go, you cannot pray salah in that building. If you look at the building, you will see Islamic calligraphy. There will be verses from the Quran relating to Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam. That room is the room of the Last Supper, which was preserved by Sayyidina al-Sultan Salah al-Din al-Ayubi rahimahullah. But the Zionists today do not want Muslims or, or Christians to know about this room. If they allow them in, they only allow them to look and leave. They do not allow Salah or anything inside that. It's a masjid. It was a masjid until the occupation. In that room, Sayyidina Isa had his supper, uh, what they refer to as the last supper, with his disciples. Now, how the account is related in the New Testament, you can read throughout the account, even if you read through secondary sources. Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam gives an indication to Judas. Now, according to the New Testament, Judas was the one who went and reported uh, Isa alayhi salam to the authorities. Why? In order to bring about the kingdom of God. Judas had heard about the kingdom of God, but was doubtful. So he, in his mind, he had thought that if he reports Isa al Salam, and Isa al Salam is arrested, and an attempt is made on his life, Isa al Salam will vanquish the Roman soldiers and establish the kingdom of God. So then, Isa al Salam advises his disciples, those of you who did not have a sword, then you must have a sword, so two of the disciples get swords and they go down into the Garden of Gethsemane. And the Garden of Gethsemane is in close proximity to that area. When they get into the Garden of Gethsemane, the soldiers arrive, but you read the account, Isa falls into sajda, into prostration. In the Christian account, he falls into sajda. 
and he supplicates to Allah. You read that can. This is not the way a man who is God, who is he prostrating to? Who is he supplicating to? He is not God. He is a what? A messenger of God. And then the soldiers arrive. Now in the Quran, we are simply told that Ma qatalu, they did not kill him. And we are told, Wa ma salabu, they did not even crucify him. Yes? And what is related the verb should be That it was made to appear as such. The details are left out. So what that has us conclude is that the crucifixion did not occur. It was made to appear as such. So what the Christians believe the account of the passion of Christ. What is the passion? The entire trial of Sayyidina Isa is taken by the Romans. The Pharisees and the scribes and the rabbis, the questions are posed, did you claim divinity? And then the court judges that Isa has committed blasphemy and therefore he must be crucified. The Romans, believe it expedient, why? Because they saw him as a political threat. So a man is taken, beaten, stripped. We do not believe this, why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ne has never um, permitted for his prophet to be disgraced through nakedness. They have never been disgraced through nakedness. And if you read the accounts, the Roman accounts, if you read historical accounts, how they crucified people, they would crucify them naked. Not with the loincloth. They would crucify them naked. And then, where the church of the sepulchre is located in Jerusalem, it is claimed that Isa Saddam was raised on the cross and passed away on the cross. Of course, the church of the sepulchre was preserved by Muslims for over 1400 years. To this day, the guardians of the church are two Muslims. Placed as guardians over the church by Sayyidina Umar giving the Christians a full right to practice their faith. Similarly, the Jews were given right of entry to Jerusalem, the only faith that governed Jerusalem, giving justice to all the other faiths, is the religion of Islam. Whenever any other faith attempted to govern Jerusalem, they committed atrocities. Like the Christians in the Crusades, they killed Muslims and Jews. Now the Jews are ruling, the Jews do not do justice to the Christians or the Muslims. The only religion and faith which has the right to govern Jerusalem is the religion of Islam. So the Church of the Sepulchre, it is claimed what Isa was crucified at that point. But what actually happened? This is one thing. Rather, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raised him. If God Allah, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Ya Isa, O oh Isa, Inni mutawafika wa rafi'uka ilayya. That, O oh Isa, I will what mutawafika wa rafi'uka ilayya and raise you. This is the belief of all Muslims qat'an that Isa alayhi salam was raised. Where was he raised? He was raised to the second heaven. So, as I said to you, all the chapters, they have a link. Surah al-Isra is linked to Surah al-Kahab. Surah Al-Kahab is linked to Surah Sayyidatina Maryam alayhi salam. When the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ascended in Laylat al-Isra wa al-Mi'raj, he met Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam on the second heaven. And Al-Isra is mentioned in chapter number 17. And Isa alayhi salam is mentioned in chapter number 19. And in the second heaven, they discuss Ashrat al Why? Because the divine command of the Ashrat al descends in the second heaven. 
And Sayyidina Isa is also located in the second heaven. And Sayyidina Isa is one of the Ashraf Ustara. Wa innahu, the Qira'ah is what? La'ilmul Nisa'ati. But there is also La'alamul Nisa'ati. That innahu, he is indeed what? La'ilmul Nisa'ati. One of the knowledges, one of the type of knowledge of the the hour, who said Isa is salam. The Dhamir, the pronoun, wa inna hu, goes back to Sayyidina Isa is salam. Wa in min ahli kitab. And there is no one from the people of the book. Illa la yu'minanna bihi qabla mawti. Except that he shall believe in Isa is salam before his death. In the Quran, before the passing away of Isa alayhi salam, everyone from the Ahlul Kitab will believe in Isa alayhi salam. This has not happened. This occurred is one of the Ashraf al That the Jews and the Christians will accept Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam. Which tells us <clears throat> when Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam will descend in Damascus, at that time, the Jews and the Christians will congregate in a journey on Umawi with the Muslims. Demonstrating that there are two types of Jews. There are those Jews who will follow the Dajjal, and there are those Jews who will be willing to accept the truth. Demonstrating that Islam does not fall into the definition of what is known as anti-Semitism in the West. There is no such thing in Islam. Anti-Semitism is actually a Western outlook toward the Jewish people. In Islam, the entire criticism of Bani Israel is a criticism of their theology, not as a race. Otherwise, as I mentioned, Sayyidatuna Maryam salam is praised in today's day and age, she would be referred to as a Jewish woman. There is no racial hatred in Islam, but there is an ideological an ideological problem with Zionism. And that ideological problem goes back in history also. So today there are people who claim to be Muslims who are Zionists. So in that time, when Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam will descend, the Jews and the Christians will descend into a German Ummi also. But before we go on to that, in recent history, in the 1800s to be precise, a man by the name of Mirza Ghulam Ahmed Qadian, who was born in the 1830s, arose in the region of Punjab. Punjab is in India and Pakistan. Punjab means the five rivers, because five rivers flow through Punjab. Panj means five, Ab means rivers in Punjabi. This man, Mirza Ghulam Ahmed, initially in the 1830s, Mirza Ghulam Ahmed Qadian, his followers today refer to themselves as Ahmadi Muslims. But in reality, they are not Muslims. You should not be fooled by the term Ahmadi. We refer to them as Qadianis or Ghulamiyya. But Qadiyani is the most famous title for them. This man, he learned Farsi from some of the local clerics and some Arabic. Because the learning in the Indian subcontinent at that time was post Mughal and the, ed the education had dwindled, declined. So if you look at the education of the early ulama, like Abdul Aziz Barhami or Mullah Ahmed Jiwan, you look at their style of Arabic, their Arabic is superb. But then you look at the post Mughal scholarship, the scholarship was declining. This man, he learned Farsi, rudimentary Farsi and Arabic from some of the local clerics. Then he became a clerk, worked as a clerk in the area of Siyankot, the town from which Alama Iqbal, the poet Iqbal was from also, 
or Abdul Hakim Sial Kot, he was from that town. So Qadiani went to Sial Kot and worked as a clerk. While working as a clerk in the 1860s, he encountered Christian missionaries. When he encountered Christian missionaries, he, like a minority of ulama, started to debate those Christian missionaries. In that time, there was a Sunni alim by the name of Rahmatullahi Kayrani, who wrote the book Idhar al Haq, which is a primer for people wanting to understand the Bible from a Muslim perspective. This book is in English also, Idhar al Haq. It's in Arabic also. Mirza Bula Ahmed had encounters with the Christian missionaries and defeated them at some time and was applauded as a hero by some clerics, especially by the Wahhabi clerics of the Indian subcontinent. They applauded him as a hero at the time. In the 1870s and 1880s, when he was applauded by, as a hero for Islam, the treatment he was given by his followers gave the rise to a narcissistic personality disorder in Mirzabula, NPD. The people, they would pick up his shoes when he would perform ablution, they wouldn't allow the water to touch the ground, they gave him high reverence. And at that time, he had many chronic illnesses. In order to heal himself from those chronic illnesses, he took medicine which had cannabis as well as opium and other, uh, what in the Indian subcontinent is known as Hakim medicine. Hakim medicine is a claim to having some organic type of medicine or some homeopathic type of medicine, but sometimes this medicine contains harmful substances. He would make the medicines himself, and those medicines gave rise, coupled with his NPD, rise to what a problem of hallucination. And therefore he made the claim firstly of being the Mahdi. The Mahdi being from the family, the Ahlul Bayt of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will appear at the end of time. Later, the hallucinations developed worsened to the point that he claimed to be the reincarnation of Isa al-Salaam, therefore the relevance to the talk. He claimed to be the reincarnation of Isa al-Salaam, but he was challenged. So the first alim to have written against him was an alim by the name of Ghulam Dastaghir Qasuri. Rahimullah, he wrote a book in Arabic. The book will be published, inshallah, in a few months by our publishing house. Dawri Imam Yusuf al-Nabarani in Arabic, in the Arabic language. Published for the first time in recent times. It was published back then. But it was the first work written against Mirza Ghulam Ahmed Qadian. The ulama who contended his claims, they said to him that Isa al shall descend at the eastern minaret of Damascus. The hadith mentions at the white minaret Damishq, at the eastern point of Damascus. So he said if you draw a line up from Damascus to India to Qadian, the line goes eastwards. This is the meaning. But they said to him, there is another problem with that. And that problem is that no minaret exists in Qadian that fits the description. So he commissioned the construction of a white minaret in Qadian. This is why you will notice the so-called Ahmadi movement or the Qadian movement, they have a white minaret as the logo. So when he commissioned this, they started the foundational work. When they started the foundational work, in around 1903, they were unable to finish the construction. So his followers, they asked him, what is the wisdom of us not being able to, uh, to finish the construction of the white minaret 
He said Allah will give reward to the later generations. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala disgraced him because he died. By 1907 he had died. And the minaret was not completed. It was completed after his lifetime. So he had not fulfilled any prophecy whatsoever. But the Ahmadiyya, so-called Ahmadiyya, the Qadianiyya, they will claim that the white minaret east of Damascus is that minaret. When in reality the minaret is in the al jami al And there is another minaret in the eastern side of Damascus with a cross constructed by the Christians. So there are two opinions. It's one of the two minarets within Damascus. So Mirza Ghulam Ahmed Qadiyani raised an issue where he claimed that Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam did not die on the cross. According to him, they placed Isa alayhi salam on the cross. He survived. When he survived, he migrated afterwards to Kashmir. And he died in Kashmir. This is a claim. And some Western writers also make this claim. They say they attempt to make the claim that Isa al Salam had some links with Buddhists. They wrote some English books on this. I have those words. But I can tell you that Isa al Salam is not buried in Kashmir. I can tell you this as a matter of fact because the Quran negates this. And the Sunnah negates this. And then thirdly, the Ahl Kashmir negate this also. People of Kashmir do not hold such beliefs. So there is a shrine in occupied Kashmir, in, in the valley region, which is, is the shrine belongs to someone else. But the Qadiyani sect believe it's the shrine of Isa alayhi salam. So this question of Isa alayhi salam ascending and descending in the end of times arose from the Qadiyani sect in the 1800s. Some of them then wrote a question to Al-Azhar, Al-Azhar al al Sharif in Cairo, one of the leading Sunni Muslim universities. And they questioned the Mashaykh in Al-Azhar at the time. Now remember Al-Azhar was going through tumultuous times Lord Cromer and other British authorities in, uh, in Egypt at the time, they had placed certain officials within Al-Azhar to take the direction of, of Al-Azhar down the political route, like we are people today, attempting to take Islam down the wrong political route. There were people who were influenced by Muhammad Abdu, Rashid Rida, and Al-Afghani, who was not Al-Afghani actually, he was from Iran, he was from Astrabad, but he gave himself the description of Al-Afghani. Muhammad Abdu had two phases. One phase was when he was a traditional Sunni scholar, but then he was influenced by the way of Al-Afghani, and he took a different route. They are basically the Rashid Gungohi, Ashraf Ali Tanwi, Qasim Nanotwi, Khalid Ambedwi of Egypt. So like we have scholars in the Indian subcontinent who were Munharif, diverted from the way of Ahl Sunnah and Jama'ah, you had these scholars in al azhar al-Sharif at the time who diverted. They influenced other people like Mahmoud Shantud, who then gave the fatwa, the verdict, that Isa alayhi salam died and was not raised and will not return in the end of times. This was then refuted by the ulama of Ahl Sunnah wa Jama'ah, like Shaykh al Islam Mustafa Sabri, Rahimallah, Al Shaykh Zahid al Kawthari, Rahimallah, and many of the ulama, they refuted this claim that to deny the raising of Isa alayhi salam and the descent of Isa alayhi salam is kufr disbelief. To deny this is what? Disbelief. So the Qadiyanis, they said, there are a few 
shubahat, obscurities which people bring up which must be answered. One of those obscurities, they say when the Quran says, Rather Allah raised him to himself. They say, when you say ilayhi, does this mean Allah has makan? Did he raise him to himself to a place, a location? Do you believe Allah is in a place? The answer is very simple. The Quran states, إِلَيْهِ يَسْعَدُ الْكَلِمُ الْقَيِّمُ وَالْعَمَلُ الصَّالِحُ يَرْفَعُ To him, ascend, إِلَيْهِ يَسْعَدُ الْكَلِمُ الْقَيِّمُ The pure words, وَالْعَمَلُ الصَّالِحُ The good actions, يَرْفَعُ He raises it. He raises it. The way the good word ascends to Allah, and Allah raises it, Isa a.s. was raised and ascended. To where? To the heavens. This is the meaning of بَرَّفَعَهُ اللَّهُ إِلَيْهِ Additionally, grammatically, بَلْ comes in order to negate whatever is before. Whatever is before. If you check even a basic book of Nahab, or works like Mughni Dabi, you'll find بَلْ comes to negate whatever is before. So whatever comes before بَرَّفَعَهُ اللَّهُ إِلَيْهِ Allah is negating that. What did Allah negate? Allah negated his death. That he died on earth and that his enemies were able to harm him. No. Rather Allah raised him. Additionally, وَرَافِعُكَ إِلَيَّ And I will raise you to myself. They say, regarding this, this means that Allah will raise him to a high rank. This is what they mean. الرَّفْعُ الْمَعَنُونِ how do we refute this? Very simple. If this meant Allah is raising him, the meaning of the verse then would be, رَافِعُكَ إِلَيَّ I am raising you to myself. Which is false. Because no one's rank is raised to the rank of Allah. If we took the meaning to mean that Allah is raising him in status, the meaning that would be رَافِعُكَ إِلَيَّ would mean Raising you to myself, meaning raising your status to myself. But the meaning is what? Raising your body to myself. Meaning to the heavens. And this is the meaning of mutawafika. The correct meaning of mutawafika, some scholars disputed this. They said, did Isa salam taste death and was raised? Some said he fell asleep and was raised. Some say the correct position is he was raised entirely. Body and soul, mutawafika. This is the meaning of mutawafika. They can debate that, but they cannot deny the raising. They cannot deny that Isa and Salam was raised. Then you have the descent of Isa and Salam. And as the Quran states, "Wa min ahli kitab illa la yuminna bi qabla mawtihi." There is no one from the people of the book except that they should believe in him prior to his death. If that sign has occurred, then all the Ahlul Kitab should believe in Isa Alayhi Salaam. But do they believe in it? The answer is no. Do the Jews believe in it? The answer is no. Do the Christians believe in it correctly? The answer is no. The sign before the Day of Judgment is before the passing away of Isa Alayhi Salaam, the Ahlul Kitab will all believe in him. This is one of the signs of the Day of Judgment. Then the descent of Isa a.s. is narrated by over 28 Sahaba. Over 28 Sahaba. In over 80 hadith. This is known as mutawatir, mass transmission. And if anyone rejects a mass transmitted hadith that is known by necessity in religion, he commits disbelief, kufr. So the descent of Isa al is known in religion by necessity. One final point is regarding the logicality of this. Some people think this is rationally impossible. But that would mean they limit the divine power. The Qudra of Allah relates to everything which is rationally possible. The question is, is Allah able to raise a man to the heavens, keep him in a different realm to ours, like a time zone. 
and then sending down again at the end of times, is this possible for Allah? The answer is yes. Those who question this, in fact, question the divine power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the position of Isa alayhi salam, ascending and descending in the end of times, is something which is textually and rationally proven, textually in Al-Quran Kareem, and the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and rationally proven by, by the mind also, it does not contradict the mind. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to safeguard our beliefs from inhiraf, to never divert from the way of Ahl Sunnah wa Jama'ah, to stay on the way of Imam Abu Hassan al-Ash'ari, Ali bin Ismail al-Ash'ari, Al Imam Abu Muhammad, Muhammad bin Muhammad al Maturidi, and Al Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal, and all the previous Aimmat al Islam, like Al Imam Ja'far al Sadiq, who was the Imam of Ahl Sunnah wa Jama'ah, and Al Imam Abu Hanifa and Nu'man bin Thabit, and Al Imam Muhammad bin Idris al Shafi'i, and all the other great ulama of the Salaf, like Al Imam Malik bin Anas, Al Imam Sufyan bin Uyayna, Al Imam Sufyan al Thawi, Al Imam Abdullah bin Al Mubarak, radiallahu anhum, and then back to the companions Ali and Ridwan. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep us on the ijma' of the companions Ali and Ridwan and give us death on Ahl Sunnah wa Jama'ah and Kalimat al Shahada. Aqul qawli hada wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa atubu ilayhi. Dr. Allah was very, very insightful. Quite even, Shaykh of Allah, who historically where we start and throughout. I believe mean, has already answered many of the questions that I was thinking of. But during the talk, he's already elaborated on them. But it's an open QA. Preferably, if you could ask questions on this subject, eschatology, signs of the engagement of the last hour. And if not, then after that, we can have a general open QA on any subject that you do want to ask from the Sheikh tonight, and he's here for your. Uh, With regard to the first question, which relates to the white minaret and why the white, white minaret is important or its importance has been located within Syria, firstly, the white minaret is a demonstration of the Nabuwa of the Prophet that in the lifetime of the Prophet there was no white minaret in Damascus that fitted the description. The white minaret was constructed later as Al Imam Abu Al Fida Ismail bin Kathir, Rahimahullah, great scholar of the commentary of the Quran and the Tariq, the history of Bidayah and Nihaya, he mentions that the minaret was constructed in his lifetime. So, 700 years after the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, a minaret was constructed which demonstrates the truthfulness of the Messenger of Allah Why the land of Asham is important is because firstly it's Mahbat, it's the descending point of the earth. Even the lowest point of the earth is in Asham, the Dead Sea, the lowest point on earth. Asham is the heart, Qalb al When something happens to the Qalb, everything else is in turbulence. This is why in the Musannaf of Abu Raza, there is a hadith that every fitna tribulation is light until it is in a sham. Why? Because once it happens in a sham, the tribulation spreads everywhere else. So a sham is that land in which people like Sayyidina Isa al be sent but also in which a Dajjal is destroyed. So when a Dajjal appears outside Al-Madinah al, al munawwarah 
at the salt marshes, uh, which is near Jurf, in Jurf, near Mount Uhud. And the angels turn him away back to Asham. He will go back to Asham and perish in Sham. Because Asham is that land where the enemies of Islam also congregate. And they perish. So the enemies today, if they plot against Bilal al-Sham, they will perish. Eventually they will perish. In one hadith, it is stated that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states that Bilal al-Sham is from the arrows, the divine arrows of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because it destroys the enemies. Then the role of Isa after he descends is that Sayyiduna Isa will firstly descend in the Grand Umayyad Masjid and then go to Jerusalem. He will chase a Dajjal to the eastern gate of Lut. At Lut, he will kill a Dajjal. The Dajjal will be killed. So the first task of Isa is to kill a Dajjal, the individual. After which Isa takes the remaining believers to Mount Sinai where they take refuge from Ya'juj and Ma'juj. This is the second stage of Isa descent. After the destruction of Ya'juj and Ma'juj, Isa then rules that region as well as, well as the rest of the world, governing by the Quran and Sunnah, and then goes to Makkah and Mukarrama to perform the Hajj. He will pass away in al Madina al Munawrah and be buried next to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Yes, so even though there are people buried next to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, an area has been left vacant in next to the grave of the Prophet sallallahu to this day. There is an entire discussion involving the story of Nuruddin Zengi and how he constructed an iron structure over the graves, with the iron structure which exists to this day. I'll give more detail of this in my book, which will be out soon, inshallah. Uh, we have a question for you. Imran Hussein doesn't hold that view. Imran Hussein believes in the descent of Isa mm. He believes in the ascension and descent. So when we ascribe something to someone, we must be accurate. Uh, secondly, the denial of the ascension and descent of Isa is kufr. Because it's ma'noon fi deen bi darura. It's known in religion by necessity. Especially the rough the physical ascension of Isa is Yes, so it's an entire methodology where they would state that at the Jal is a system, there is no individual, the hadith of the figurative. Because this was a madrasa, a, a school of thought that had its roots in the late 1800s and the early 1900s, where they believe they are rationalizing everything. So even one of the individuals is the brother mentioned. There is no real rationality behind this. It was actually uh, anti ahl sunnah method, anti ashari method of denying the hadith. And if they don't deny the hadith, then stating that we must interpret the hadith in order to fit our minds. But when we say fit our minds, they were mixing hukm al ada with hukm aqli. You have hukm al ada, which is 
judgments we can take from observing things on a daily basis and judgments of the mind. When we say something is irrational, we mean hukm aqli. But they were mixing hukm aqli with hukm al -adha. So anything that they thought was impossible, they began denying the hadith. So the, the Ahl Sunnah ulama, firstly, we demonstrate the rationality behind the beliefs, that it does not contradict hukm aqli. And secondly, that the hadith are authentic and have been authentically transmitted. I can also ask the Sheikh to repeat the question for the sure. purpose of the uh, recording as well. The question on this side. We do not say, the question is that when Isa returns back, uh, how can we say that he will return back as a non-profit when no favor is taken away from him? We do not say he will return as a non-profit. We say he will return back as a prophet, but there is no wahi. Wahi has finished. Wahi is what? Revelation. So after the Quran, there is no wahi. Nabuwa is never taken away. So Khidr salam. If we take the position that Khidr was a Nabi, and if we take the other position that he's still alive on earth, he's still a Nabi alive on earth, but he has no Wahi. Likewise, Isa salam will have no Wahi, but their dreams, the dreams of prophets, are so powerful that they can be informed of things through dreams and other ways. But there is no Wahi after the Prophet and there is no new prophet after the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam okay uh, muslim and especially the rasulullah al jamaah has a belief that the uh, isa alayhi salam will return as a believer of nabi alayhi salam as a woman not as a nabi no every prophet retains his nabuwa but every prophet is now also a follower of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam so for instance when he returns back, he is a Nabi, but a Nabi Tabi, a Prophet who follows the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You cannot strip him of his Nabuba. Yeah. It is also mentioned in the Quran when the Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came in the ayah, uh, and you will have to uh, reject all the other Sharia and you will have to follow the Sharia of Nabi. So he will be a follow, yeah. follower, but he's still a Nabi. What's the significance of the pigs being slaughtered? So again, uh, in the hadith of Isa al -Salam returning, the hadith states, he should yaksir al-salim, he should break the cross, and yaktul uh, wa yaktul al khinzir and should kill the swine. Some people, when they read this, they think this means Isa al -Salam will physically go to every crucifix, break every crucifix, and kill all the swine. The meaning of this is not that. The meaning is that Christianity as a religion will finish because the people will realize he is not God Almighty and they will believe in him as a prophet. Secondly, the killing of the swine refers to the domestication of the swine will finish. No one will consume the swine meat because he will prohibit this. This is the meaning. But some, uh, some people to make a mockery, so some people to make a mockery of the hadith they say, oh, how can this hadith be logical when it's saying he will destroy the cross and he will go and kill the swine? Uh, can you imagine the Isa is not going around breaking every crucifix and killing all the swine? Again, when figurative interpretation does apply, these people don't apply it. When it suits them, they misapply it. They have no fixed methodology. But in Arabic, you have rhetoric, the rule of rhetoric, which is balagha, ilmul balagha. In balagha, the meaning would be Wayaksir al is a kinaya, a metonym for Christianity. Wayaktul al khinzir it's a kinaya for finishing off domestication of poor, uh, pig for people to consume swine. Question back there. What is the actual role of the Jewish and Jewish? And what are they and where are they coming from? You see, Yajuj and Ma'juj are a tribe of people that have been sealed by Sayyidina Dhulu Tarnayn 
and the entire account is given in Surah Al-Kahf. Their road is after the killing of Al-Dajjal at the gate of Lut, and they appear post-apocalyptic uh, times, post-Armageddon, in a time when their numbers are huge relatively in that time to the people in that time. Currently, they are sealed up by the barrier of the Qarnayn alayhi salam, the location of which is only known to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But in that underground civilization, in some hadith, they are described as being red-headed, meaning red hair. Anyone who is starved of oxygen or sunlight for long periods of time, their hair will turn red. Secondly, some of the hadith narrated by Nu'ayb bin Hammad in Al-Fitr, they mention the sources of sustenance for Ya'jud and Ma'juja through a river. That every day Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings for them through fresh waters certain fish for them to consume. And this is a ghayb known to Allah. So some people have tried discovering the barrier of Ya'jud and Ma'juj. Some explorers went to the region of Kirghistan and they found a barrier, they found iron blocks. Others have presumed uh, the barrier to have been destroyed in Georgia and other regions. There are whole books written on this subject, but the reality is that it's a ghayb from the ghayub, uh, a ghayb, the unknown thing from the unknown things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created and can never be determined until their appearance. This is the reality, because if you study Surah Al-Kahf, you will realize there is a wisdom why Ya'juj and Ma'juj are mentioned in that chapter. The seven sleepers slept in the cave for 300 years and they were never discovered. Khidr only uncovered certain knowledge to Musa when and it was appropriate. There is a reason for that. The entire chapter is to demonstrate to us that there are certain ghayb that you can never know until Allah uncovers it. So the Ya'juj and Ma'juj people will always speculate, but it, it's a mutashabi, meaning you cannot know it, but later Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will remove the tashabu when the sign occurs. When the sign occurs, the doubt or the obscurity will be removed for all. From the previous. So 
Al Imam Al Hassan will do Nas of Al Imam Hussein. Al Imam Hussein will do of Al, uh, Al Imam Zayn Al Abidi, and like this, each one in succession. The Ahl Sunnah and Jamaah say no. Al Imam Al Ahl Bayt is inclusive, inclusive of a broad variety of Imams of the Ahl Bayt, including Al Hassan Al Muthanna, including, including Abdullah Al Mahad, including Al Nafs Al Zakiya, and then the lines carry on. Like Sheikh Abdul Qadir al Jilani and so many others. While the 12 Shia, they reject Al Imam Zayd. They reject Al Imam Ismail. The Ismailis only go with Al Imam Ismail. But the Ahl Sunnah accept all of them. And we also say that all of them were on the creed of Ahl Sunnah, same as us. One of the narrators of a Tirmidhi, he was a companion of Sayyidina Ali radiallahu ta'ala an. And he accompanied Sayyidina Ali radiallahu an for over 20 years. And he says that many of the things that people are ascribing to Sayyidina Ali radiallahu an were never taught by Sayyidina Ali radiallahu an. They concocted so many beliefs and ascribed them to Sayyidina Ali radiallahu ta'ala an. So some of these statements found in some of the Sufi books which may say that al Hasan al-Askari is al Imam Mahdi in a state of uh, hiding. This is rejected. We do not accept this as Sunni Muslim because there is no loss for this and al Imam al-Mahdi is a figure that will be born in the future. He is not in hiding in a cave as the Shia believe, the Khamas believe this. And they also write letters to the Imam. So they go to certain areas, they write letters and place them in the wells and Makkah. They have all these strange practices. This is not the Sunni belief. Sometimes you may have some Sufi books tampered with, or some of the Sufis uh, who may not be in accordance with the creed of Ahl Sunnah or Jama'ah, we do not accept those beliefs. Is it possible the Imam that he's already born? Again, the question is, is it possible that Imam Mahdi is born? You can never fall into the prediction and prophecy game. Why? The Messenger of Allah gave us four marks and signposts. Before Imam Mahdi will be born, uh, meaning before his appearance or the sign, an army will descend into Al Madina al Munawwara. And they will desecrate the city. They will desanctify the city. Then they will come out of Al Madina from Nabra and they will go into an area known as Al Bayda, which is quicksand area, and the army will be swallowed. This is one of the first signs of his appearance. This is the sign of Kharabu Yathrib. The sign of what? Kharabu Yathrib. The destruction of Yathrib. Will be what? Rumran al Quds. The building up of Al Quds. How? Al Imam al Mahdi then will, the black banners will appear from Khurasan and they will fight the people until they are placed, Hatta Tun Sabah until they are planted in Jerusalem. When they are planted in Jerusalem, this is Rumran al Quds. The building of Al Quds. This will then lead to what? Al Malhama, the Great War. After Al Malhama is Khuruj al Dajjal. Khuruj al Dajjal. This is the line of events. But Al Mahdi cannot, the, the bayah that's given to him between Bayna Rukhni and Maqam, between the Black Stone and the station of Ibrahim, alayhi salam, this sign cannot occur until the army is swallowed up in Al Bayda. And that will not occur until the Euphrates River dries up and a reservoir, a mountain of gold appears in which from every 199 people die. Some people say, we know that the drying up of the Euphrates is mentioned in Bukhari, but where does it mention it's before the Mahdi? That hadith is found in the, the Al-Fitr of Mu'ayb bin Hamad. Mu'ayb bin Hamad is one of the teachers of Al-Imam al-Bukhari, that hadith is found in his collection. 
So until these signs do not happen, we cannot say he may be born or he is born. It's speculation because you will sit waiting for him and not doing that which is expedient. You must do what is far. When the signposts happen, then we know the time is imminent. But as of yet, the signs have not happened. Even though the Euphrates has started to diminish, that sign has happened. So the mountain of gold, I can say, may be imminent. Allah knows best. But if Allah wills, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can fill the river again, and the sign may not happen for another hundred years. Only Allah knows the game. So never fall into the game of attempting to predict the future. Meaning what will his role? Yeah, okay. is there any connection with Yes, so Sayyidina Imam al Mahdi radiallahu anhu, he appears at a time in the Muni Dhulman Majal, when the earth is filled with what? Oppression and tyranny. When he appears, he brings back balance to the earth. He will rule the Arabian Peninsula and Greater Syria. But the extension of his influence will be everywhere else. So some people think he will establish a global empire. The answer is no. He will be <clears throat> a localized power, but with extension of influence. So to the extent that he will imprison people from India, the rulers of India, he will have them imprisoned. And then his armies will conquer two major cities. One is Constantinople, which is known today as Istanbul. The second concrete of Istanbul and the second city is the city of Rome. The Vatican shall be conquered by Imam al-Mahdi Will he meet the Isa al The answer is yes. When Isa al descends, the Imam of the Muslims who leads them in prayer is no other than Imam al-Mahdi And Sayyidina Isa will pray Salah behind him. So my question is like, what evidence do you have that that is false? Because if Allah, with the power of Allah, if them seven, the men in the caves were in a way sleeping for three hundred years and no one essentially knew about it until they, what makes you think? What is the evidence that Allah has not done the business? Of Allah? Like, why do these Shias believe that in a way? And what evidence do you have that is false? So. Is our rejection of the Shia belief is not based upon the irrationality of that belief. If there was a verse of the Quran or a hadith stating as such, we do not reject it based on rationality. We reject it because of the absence of a verse of the Quran stating clearly with regard to al Hasan al Askari or a hadith mentioned al, al Hasan al Askari as being al Mahdi in a state of population. So the Sunnis do not reject this based upon the rationality because the, the rationally is possible. Allah can place someone in a cave, in a location for a number of years and then they reappear. The reason for rejection is first the absence of nasus, absence of textual stipulation, but secondly, the Shia are known to have concocted so many stories that even their main book uh, al Kafi, which was written in the 4th century, that book contains so many forgeries that even the Shia reject so many of them themselves. So the sourcing of that event is spurious. There is no basis for it. And like so many other Shia claims, there is no basis for that actual belief, textually speaking. So the Sunnis do not reject it based upon rationality. Again, uh, the brother's asking about something known as Ilm al-Jafar. Is it not falling into uh, prediction? Firstly, the science itself is one. It's conjecture. It's not certainty. Secondly, so many of those who used the Ilm al-Jafar, they made mistakes. So many of the years that they predicted, they were mistaken. Thirdly, one of the signs of Ashraf al 
he is believing in the Nujum, stars, and denying the Qadr. So, not that Al Jafar is Nujum. A person should not dabble in something which is wrong and leave that which is certain. Quran and Sunnah is certain. Quran and Sunnah. All guidance is in the Quran and the Sunnah. And also the Ikra. So, because people are asking about the Shia, the Hadith says, Inni taraktu fikum thaqadain. I left you, amongst you two heavy matters. Ma in tamassaktum bihima min ba'di lam tadindu abada. That if you grasp onto these two things after me, you will never be misguided. Kitab Allah wa ikrati. The Book of Allah and my Itra, which is progeny. Who is the Itra? The Itra is Sayyidina Fatima, Sayyidina Imam al Hassan, Sayyidina Imam al Hussein, radiallahu anhu. Then their progeny, the Aimat al Huda, people of guidance from amongst them. But it also refers to Ashira al Rajul, <coughs> the men who surround the man, which includes Sayyidina Ali, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Sayyidina Ali, radiallahu anhu, had something which is known as the Sahifat al Sadiqa the truthful scroll in which he wrote down the ahadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The question is, where is that sahifa today? We Sunnis respond by saying, within the Sunni hadith collections. If some scholar went out of his way and compiled all the hadith of Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anhu just from Sunni collections, that is the sahifa to sahifa. So, when the hadith says Kitab Allah, the book of Allah, wa sunnati, and it also says Ikrati, all of this guidance is in the book of Allah and the hadith words, which contain the guidance of the Ahlul Bayt also. In some circles, there are some names given from the Khulafa of Imam um, Mehdi. Is that true? Are those names from hadith or some? There is no basis for such a claim. If the question is that some people give names of the Khulafa of Imam Mahdi, this would be speculation or a claim to Kash, both of which are prone to error. Both of which are prone to error. So we do not treat such type of things as certainty. We stick to the Quran and Sunnah. Should we just take one last question? Okay, uh, by the way. Uh, yeah, yeah. Those that are, are aware that inshallah tonight we do have a prayer uh, day. Straight after food, Sheikh will be having a private gathering with them. Those that do want to stay and ask further questions on the subject, by all means, the doors of the Masjid are open for you. Stay for longer uh, after this event. So during food or after food, you can also ask your question for the Sheikh. But we'll take one last one. This brother had his hand for a while. But there will be opportunities after the event. Let's come through. Those that want to have food, I'll soon have been something for quite a while. It's tiring. I'm tired myself. So let's uh, think to our. So, last question, please. So, why does Imam Mahdi, the Isa is said, pray behind Imam Mahdi when he has the higher status? The hadith itself answers that when Isa is salam will descend, Al Imam Mahdi will move back in order to permit Isa is salam to lead. Sayyidina Isa is salam only permits Al Imam Mahdi to lead the prayer out of honor for this ummah. And why is the ummah given honor? Because of the Prophet. So Al Imam Mahdi is given that honor because of his lineage to the Prophet. And he's linked to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So Imam Mahdi leading the prayer is in fact the fadila of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Should be written as well. Does Allah have